Welcome to a conversation with history. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest is Mark Danner, a staff writer for The New Yorker specializing in foreign affairs. He has worked on the staff of the New York Review of Books as senior editor of Harper's Magazine, as foreign affairs editor of the New York Times Magazine. He has co-written and helped produce two hour long award-winning television documentary for ABC's News' Peter Jennings reporting series. Mark is a frequent contributor to major magazines and is a frequent guest on news analysis television programs. He's the author of The Massacre of El Mazote, A Parable of the Cold War, and Beyond the Mountains, The Legacy of Duvalier. During the 1998-99 academic year, he's a visiting professor at the School of Journalism and the Human Rights Center. Uh, Mark, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Where were you educated? Well, um, I attended in my hometown of Utica, New York, uh, John F. Hughes School and then Utica Free Academy. And I was an undergraduate at Harvard College, where I took a degree in uh, modern literatures and aesthetics, which is essentially uh, comparative literature and philosophy. Um, and I'm afraid from then on, my education was in the world of uh, writing and, uh, and books and magazines. And uh, before you took off to, to confront the world, uh, what did you read as a young person? Well, um, everything. I, <laughs> <laughs> I think I did read everything. Um, I was a very um, uh, ardent reader uh, uh, as a young person, as my parents were. Um, we uh, essentially sat in the house after dinner and everybody had their book. Uh, while the TV was going, uh, <laughs> which is something I can no longer do. I don't know how my parents manage. Um, but uh, I read a good deal of uh, fiction um, when I was in junior high school and high school, and, and actually in college, too, uh, and still do read a lot of fiction. Um, have begun reading, I suppose in college, uh, started reading an awful lot of history. Uh, my father is a uh, very uh, serious amateur historian, mm -hmm. um, and he uh, got me interested in history from a very early age. Um, we used to, uh, we had a small house in the Adirondacks north of Utica, and we would drive up. It took 45 minutes to uh, get there, and when you're very young, this is an eternity, of course. And during those drives, he would tell stories which began when I was very young, uh, stories from the Iliad, uh, um, the story of, of Hector, of Achilles. At the time, I didn't know anything about the Iliad, of course. Uh, from the Old Testament, Samson and Delilah, uh, uh, David and Goliath, those were favorites. And I would beg him for them after a while. And as I got older, um, he would tell uh, more sophisticated stories, um, eventually reaching his favorite topics, which had to do with 20th century history, and in particular World War II, uh, in which he had fought. He always said that his original impetus for learning about history was that he had fought during the war, and he, as he put it, never knew what the hell was going on. Uh, so after he uh, got out of the Navy, uh, he had been in the South Pacific, off Okinawa and other places, um, he began reading about the war uh, and eventually started reading about World War I and, uh, and is still delving into those subjects. So I remember again and again him telling me about how World War I began at Sarajevo, uh, you know, the various uh, uh, interests of the players involved, giving me these intric intricate descriptions. Um, and I was fascinated by it. Um, so I can, I mean, I don't remember the first time he started telling these stories. I was so, uh, so young. Do you, do you uh, obviously, the, he, this was pointing you in a direction that you were uh, <laughs> later to pursue uh, uh, in, in uh, first hand and in greater uh, 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 detail. Uh, and we'll talk about that when we talk about your NATO article. Uh, what, what, how would you uh, summarize the values that you think you drew from your parents? Well, I, I would say, uh, first of all, um, the, the primary values I think they taught me were simply decency, um, I hope, that is, um, and how to lead a straightforward and decent life. Um, this is what they emphasized again and again. 
and also uh, the importance of doing something, of pursuing uh, an interest, a field, field of endeavor, career, what, however you'd like to phrase it, um, that made me happy and that was rewarding. Um, my father uh, was a dentist, and uh, it's very common, I think, for uh, dental medical families, and all their friends were either doctors or dentists, uh, to press the uh, children, particularly sons, to become, you know, to follow in their footsteps. There wasn't any of that in my family, and uh, my father emphasized again and again that I should do uh, what I wanted as long as I could uh, support myself. Um, and I've tried to achieve that. I'm not sure the <laughs> latter part I've quite achieved. But, uh, uh, where, where did you learn to write? You were, I know you were an editor of a high school paper. <laughs> That's with right. With one... Uh, co-editor, uh, co-editor. Co we must not forget my, uh, my co-editor, Sam Weinberg. That's right. Um, and you won an award for being the best paper in the state of New York. That's right? right. That is, to my mind, still the greatest achievement of my life. Um, <laughs> the, the UFA Corridors, which was a, a paper that had the second, I believe it was the second oldest continuously published student newspaper in the country, uh, began before the Civil War. And um, it was, you know, this high school was very uh, inner city, uh, didn't have much money. And that award always went to high schools from Long Island that had, uh, were very prosperous and so on. And we did, when I was a senior, uh, we actually got the award when I was a freshman in college, and we traveled to uh, Syracuse uh, to be in the competition where that's where we won it. Um, but it was this momentous achievement <laughs> because no one had heard of uh, the school, and uh, we were very, very proud. But I did a lot of writing, uh, obviously, for the high school newspaper. Um, I did not write for the Crimson in college, uh, although I took the writing that I did for my courses uh, very seriously. Um, uh, not always the reading <laughs> or other parts of the courses, but I did take the <laughs> writing very seriously. And um, I'm not sure where I'd say, you know, I learned to write. I just uh, was always uh, quite serious about writing. Um, I guess I could trace also a little bit of this to my parents and to my mother's side, who did a lot of writing in her life. And both my parents, uh, thank goodness, are still alive. Um, my mother um, uh, did a good deal of writing and she would write poetry. She did, you know, songs for the local uh, women's organizations and things like that. Uh, it, she was thought of as very artsy, as, you know, the, the phrase was in those days. Um, in any event, I, uh, from as early as I can remember, I uh, was very serious about writing papers, even in you know, even in uh, uh, grammar school. So, um, I don't know where that came from. What writers did you admire most uh, uh, as you began to read even more seriously? Well, I liked Mark Twain an awful lot when I was growing up. My earliest, <laughs> uh, uh, I was earliest a great fan of the Hardy Boys. Ah, <laughs> I, did you read all of them? I must say that. I did indeed yeah, I did, read all I of them. I did too, yes. <laughs> Not yeah. only did I read all of them, but I would write to uh, these, these plaintive letters to Franklin W. Dixon, <laughs> whose existence is somewhat in doubt. I don't know whether, <laughs> but uh, we don't want to show this to two people who are too young because I'd hate to disillusion them. But right. I would write these plaintive letters saying, when is the next book coming out, you know? Um, but I was very interested in those, Johnny Quest, you know, those series of books. Mm -hmm. um, later, uh, as I say, Mark Twain, um, I was very interested in. Um, I eventually uh, was interested in Albert Camus, wh whose work I really liked a lot, and Sartre. Um, I actually humiliated myself in high school by going up to the li librarian and asking her if she had anything by Albert Camus. <laughs> and I, w <laughs> I was, thought myself very serious at the time, so <laughs> she <laughs> always reminded me of it. Um, but I'm trying to think of, uh, of um, who else. Um, a lot of, I guess I was sort of given to European uh, writers at the time. I read a lot of Herman. Hess, who was very popular at the time and who I liked a lot. Um, and that brought me to Thomas Mann, um, uh, Death in Venice. I loved uh, André Gide. I seem to be, read a lot of European things. Um, I don't know why that is, but uh, maybe because they had a certain glamour. Um, but that is certainly what I was reading in junior high and, and high school. 
So after college, you decided to become a writer. What, what was your first big, or, or actually, what, is that not correct? Did, did you actually? I, I don't think it's correct. I think um, it's an odd thing. I, I think you'd find this sort of maybe convoluted, semi-convoluted answer from a lot of people who write for, for a living. Um, I never really remember making a decision mm -hmm. to become a writer. I, I think by the time, certainly, that I was in college, I assumed it. Although I would never have certainly the nerve if someone said, what are you going to do when you get out of here, to actually say, oh, I'm going to be a writer. Mm -hmm. Because that seemed much too uh, brazen or presumptuous. Uh, and indeed, I don't think I'd say it even now. I mean, there is a sense that, uh, you know, when you think, if you have people you admire greatly who are writers, and I, I always tend to think, well, at some point I will be a writer, even though indeed I make my living uh, from it now. Um, but I did certainly didn't decide it on graduating from college. In fact, I uh, spent the summer after I graduated in a small apartment in Harvard Square, sort of lying on my back and living on uh, uh, delivered uh, uh, fried rice from the Hong Kong restaurant in Harvard <laughs> Square. Who some of your listeners may know, this pink, big pink building. And I got to know the delivery man very well. And if I, know, if I knew then what I know now, I'd say I was very depressed. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the time, I thought I was resting, I mm -hmm. think. But uh, <laughs> so I was, didn't know what I wanted to do. And I think I couldn't admit you know, that this is what I wanted to do. And um, by happenstance, actually, I came to work at the New York Review. Um, uh, so I, in retrospect, who knows if it was by happenstance. But at the time, it seemed like it. And, but what was your first big uh, uh, writing uh, 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 assignment or uh, something that you chose what, uh, in, in terms of foreign affairs? Well, um, when I was at Harper's, I did a good deal of, um, I was editing various articles. And at the same time, I was editing a section that then appeared regularly, monthly. This is no longer the case, called the forum section. Um, and that was a discussion uh, amongst uh, people we invited on a given subject. Um, and you'd do the introduction to it, which I would do monthly, um, and do the editing of it. I then went uh, from Harper's to uh, Haiti, um, which, you know, I'm still, is a subject of, that turned out to obsess me. I mean, I'm still working on it in one way or another. Uh, it's a country that's uh, fascinating to me. Um, I went to Haiti to do a piece uh, for, Har for Harper's. In the event, I ended up, ended up excuse me, publishing at the New York Times Magazine um, sometime later. Um, but it was a story that, uh, I mean, there are these stories that sort of seize you. Mm -hmm. And at the time I went to Haiti, uh, Duvalier, uh, the dictator of, uh, at the end of a 30-year uh, dynasty dictatorship. This would be what year now? This well, this would be 86, 86 actually. Yeah. Uh, so this is the first big, I had earlier done uh, for the Times a fairly large piece on nuclear uh, uh, weapons. Um, I mean, I'd done a number of things, but I think if you look back uh, and say what is the, you know, first serious uh, piece of writing for, for publication I did, it would probably be uh, this story in Haiti. So that was five years after I uh, graduated. Um, and that resulted, the Haiti uh, piece resulted in, in three articles, three long articles in The New Yorker. That's right. And um, when one reads those articles, uh, lo and behold, there's a lot of history there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> and and uh, uh, do you feel now, in retrospect, as you've done these pieces, that grappling with the, the history is really the key to getting to people to understand a particular place, whether it's Haiti, Bosnia, El Salvador? Well, that's a, that's a very good and, uh, I think, big question. I mean, history is destiny, without a doubt, when it comes to uh, a lot of these uh, violent um, uh, places, or I should say violent situations. Um, I'm drawn, I think, to these places partly, I mean, I can quote a Haitian political scientist and one-time president, for he was president for a few months before he was thrown over in a military coup, named Leslie Moniga, who spoke of uh, violence um, as uh, a force that strips the society nude, strips it naked, the better to listen and hear the heartbeat beneath. So mm -hmm. I think during violent 
situations, quasi-revolutions, coup d'etat, you start to understand how a society works. Now, so that's one dimension, the present, but to actually then follow those bits of information about how this place works, how the different parts fit together, who has what interest, why people are acting in a certain, a certain way that may seem illogical to you, it's usually very necessary to go back somehow and try to understand where the society came from. Uh, Haiti is a particularly good case just because its history is so fascinating, unusual, um, uh, heavy on its present. I mean, Haitians really walk in history. And though the country is three quarters illiterate, they all know uh, the history of their country much more certainly than Americans would know uh, the history of theirs. Um, to me, the, one of the great challenges uh, writing these stories is trying to um, implicate the history in the present narrative of, of events. There is a tendency uh, to place, you know, like a big glob, the backstory, you know, the his history in the middle of the piece. And this is a classic, you know, what is it called in Washington, Migo, mine eyes glaze over, mm -hmm. uh, tactic, because people say, oh, uh, you know, Haiti was born in 1492 as a, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's an awful signal. And um, the key, it seems to me, is always to try to break it into small pieces and try to connect it very much to what the present is, you know, uh, almost to atomize history um, and to try to analyze it according to the present much more. Um, I mean, I think you're right in implying that this comes from, obviously, from my own interests in history, but I do feel very strongly that if you're trying to understand, I mean, Haiti, for example, is this, you know, perplexing place. I mean, there was this the dictator was overthrown in 1986. That's 12 years ago. Um, people thought then there would be democracy, you know, transition to democracy. It's been uh, a dozen years. There have been five military coups. The U.S. actually invaded, uh, you know, this country that's a uh, hundred times or a thousand times more powerful. And still, uh, they're in horrible shape. And the, the government is blocked. And, uh, and the question is, well, why? Why is this so? How do we understand that? And isn't, as Americans, aren't we often guilty of not looking at the history and, and, and hence uh, our policy often fails in these places for that reason? Well, I would say certainly that's true. I think the question, your question, you know, is very, and the point is very well taken. I think I'd divide it into two parts. Uh, Americans, the great body of Americans and their interests or lack thereof in the world, uh, uh, and this isn't, necessarily anything to criticize people for. They have their own lives. Um, they aren't necessarily, I mean, you can't learn the history of a place through the newspaper. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't learn everything about Central America by news newspaper accounts. You have to read books and you have to go to other sources. Uh, the other part of the question, of course, is the elites who run foreign policy. And I think it is true, though, they have history very much available to them. I mean, they have area specialists, they have people in the State Department, in the Pentagon, uh, the National Security Council staff, all the organs of government who are very, the CIA of course, who are very well informed um, on uh, historical backgrounds of places. The question is, what is the reason they make policies and how much do they include history in those reasons? And certainly during the period of the Cold War, uh, the sort of maître pensée, you know, the, the sort of overwhelming thinking had nothing to do really with history. It had to do with a larger view of the world in which uh, these other places were simply prizes in a large game. So uh, the historical attributes of these places were interesting only insofar as they started to cause us problems, the United States problems as it, uh, for example, Vietnam, I think, there was no lack of awareness in different parts of the government of the history of this country. Uh, it's simply that when it came to decision making, the historical uh, details that might have been, uh, if they were taken more into account, might have caused different decisions, were simply not important to policymakers. There were other things that were more important. And, and some of those reasons were, on the one hand, ideological, their, their notion about how the world was divided, and then was it also their vision of their 
domestic political vulnerabilities? Oh, certainly, I think so. You mean Vietnam specifically? Vietnam specifically, but also some of these other cases that you've looked at, uh, 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 intervention in Haiti, mm -hmm. for example. Well, oh, certainly. Um, I mean, those are two very good examples. Uh, Vietnam, of course, you did have uh, uh, this history with the Democratic Party of losing China. Um, and it was very difficult, I think, to back up in Vietnam uh, when it came to domestic policy, particularly when Johnson took office and had very strong domestic goals that depended on the support of the so-called Southern Bourbon senators, you know, Democrats, Richard Russell, a uh, number of other people who had great power and great seniority who were against his programs, um, but who, cert who he could cajole Mm -hmm. But certainly, if he had backed up on Vietnam, he would have lost them, um, and he knew that. Um, Haiti is another question, and a more interesting one, because we're in a different era, and I think you're right in the implication that the invasion probably wouldn't have happened without the fact, I mean, if it had been a Republican president, for example, mm -hmm. during the same time, there would have been no invasion. And, and we're talking about the Clinton... Uh, That's uh, right, uh, 1994. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. It's one of the main reason, reasons was the congressional, the interest of and, and uh, uh, power of the Congressional Black Caucus. Um, they were very strong supporters of Clinton. Uh, they had stayed with him right along the way, including for health care and various things that he was almost alone on. And um, uh, I'm not saying he did it simply for them, but certainly they had strong political weight, I think. Your, your writing is characterized uh, by a, a rich uh, historical sense. Uh, we've just talked about that. But, but you're also uh, a man who goes to the scene. Uh, who who uh, writes uh, and clarifies our understanding of what's going on. Uh, in, in the case of your articles on uh, Haiti, uh, uh, you, were, you found yourself in some very dangerous situations. Uh, tell us about how that, the, the writer uh, as observer, uh, uh, plays itself out and how it, it conflicts with this notion of a historian sort of looking back and so on. Do those, do those two uh, uh, Mark Danner identities conflict with each other or do they <laughs> mesh nicely? Um, I, I'm not sure. I've never felt a conflict in okay. any event. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they, may, they may well. I don't know. I do know that, you know, there's an odd thing about uh, going, uh, whether it's Haiti or Bosnia or Salvador. Um, you are given a privileged position. I mean, Haiti, of course, it's, it's uh, even more pronounced because you're white um, and you stand out. But you're given a privileged position. You're the observer, the watcher. You have a notebook. You stand there. Others have cameras. You know, there's certain apparatus that mark them out as separate. Um, and it's a remarkable thing uh, because you will be in the middle of, of scenes of, of violence. Uh, certainly in Haiti, I, I was in, in several, um, and in Bosnia too, where uh, for some reason there is this space of peace that you are allowed to occupy. Hmm. And of course there is no particular reason why that cannot be breached at any moment. It, um, it's almost as if, you know, in the cartoon when uh, Wiley Coyote runs off the cliff and runs off into the air until he looks down he doesn't fall <laughs> and um, uh, I remember very much a incident in Haiti where uh, 1987 the so-called aborted election uh, very sunny day a Sunday all these people came out to vote uh, and the Makuts the Tonton Makuts uh, of Duvalier attacked several polling places they, they shot at us as well um, and uh, they attacked several polling places and just um, killed a great number of people um, very savagely with machetes and automatic weapons you know, in broad daylight. Uh, and people went back into their houses and there's something very striking about a huge capital utterly empty on a, a sunny, perfectly sunny day. It's like a De Chirico, uh painting. Um, but one of the things they did is after a particular bloody incident at a polling place where they killed 19 people, uh, some journalists showed up immediately. I was not among them. Um, and uh, they were standing around taking pictures and taking notes and so on, and you had all these bodies. And um, suddenly the Makuts came back uh, and shot three journalists, just point blank. Hmm. Um, 
And this, you know, it was like the coyote looking down. I mean, suddenly uh, there was nothing holding any of us up. Everyone went into the hotel. And at a particular point, someone drove by, at least this was what people said, drove by the front of the hotel and waved a gun. Mm -hmm. And there was a stampede in the lobby. Hmm. And people, I mean, there were probably 500 journalists there for this election. And they, people smashed through the back wall of the hotel, which was mostly glass, destroyed the entire lobby in their uh, keenness to get away. So it was this astounding, you know, these are foreign correspondents mm -hmm. who spent their lives covering situations mm -hmm. like this. And yet this removing, this protective shell, um, was a terrifying thing. Um, now, your original question was whether these, uh, the historical and the uh, observer on the scene uh, personas are somehow separated. Um, I don't think so, because I think the persona is the person gathering information and trying to see what is different, trying to detail. Uh, it's the eye trying to detail what this place looks like and how um, it's interesting and how it's puzzling um, and how indeed one can get to the end and tell what happened, which is really the point in the end, to tell what happened. Um, and the historical part has to do with that because in the end, you're t trying not only to tell what happened, but, w but why, you know, to try to make it make sense. I mean, it, the uh, Makut, you know, this idea of killing people, or in Salvador, the idea of killing 126 children, um, I think you're not doing your job unless you make some effort to have people understand how someone could do that. Because it isn't acceptable to simply say, these are evil people. Evil people swept down and killed these people. Uh, you haven't gone far enough. And in fact, in Salvador, I eventually found people who told me about reactions within this particular, the Atlacatl uh, Battalion in the Army, uh, and how they had complained about it and resisted it. And, you know, they were human beings. I mean, they did it um, eventually. Um, but and afterwards, there were grumblings about it. Uh, so the officers had to, you know, yell at the soldiers. In any event, one of, the, uh, one of your tasks is to try to make these things, first of all, to tell what happened, and also to, to do so in a way that it's understandable. I and think. how do you do that? Because that's the, the next task. You've, you've read the history, you've done the observation, now you have to tell the story. One of the things that strikes me in your writings, whether on Bosnia, uh, El Salvador, or Haiti, uh, uh, even your article on NATO is, is the striking images by which you uh, draw the reader into the situation and into your analysis of the situation. Well, I, you know, the question of how um, is a very difficult one uh, because it involves, uh, you know, a very mysterious area of human endeavor, which is how you create something. And uh, I think if you asked a scientist the same thing, or a computer programmer, perhaps, or, uh, you know, a painter, there are all these areas where people have nothing and create something. And uh, there is, at some point, a spark that, I mean, I have, do not work very methodically, which makes me a, not a terribly good, in some ways, a good example for students here, I'm afraid, because, um, I almost have to have the beginning of a piece before I can write it. Um, somehow there has to be a sound in my ear uh, about how that thing starts. Uh, I've almost started to think of it as uh, a sonata form because, uh, you know, the idea that you have a tonal and then you go to a dominant and you eventually recover the tonal at the end. Um, so you start with a suspension of some kind, a bit of tension. Uh, and if things uh, work, I mean, this is just how I think of it. It might sound pretentious, but this is how I mm -hmm. tend to think of it. Um, uh, almost from the first sentence or the first paragraph, uh, I'd like to establish some kind of strong narrative tension on the part of the reader. Uh, that is, you know, what is this? What's happening? Um, what... Uh, you know, you want to, uh, in, some, in some way, put up in front of the reader a question, an intriguing, powerful question to which they must have the answer. 
and uh, it has to be done uh, in a way that is almost, uh, I mean, to use a much overused word now, visceral. You know, it has to, you have to feel it. Um, uh, and that may be a description of a place, a description of an action. Um, uh, there are all sorts of ways to do it. Um, but you want to start off on a journey that the reader is bodily taken on so that from the first sentence, particularly when you're writing long pieces, I mean, you're asking a lot of people, I think, particularly today when, you know, uh, I mean, as everyone says, the throwaway line, there are great deals of competition um, in entertainment and information and so on. You're asking a lot of people to sit down and read you for three hours or four hours. You want to grab them at the beginning and say, here's this story, um, and do it in as vivid a way as possible. Um, and if, it's, if you do it right, you come back uh, precisely to that point at the end. It should be like that final chord. Um, uh, in the El Masote book that you mentioned, uh, the end is about a helicopter crashing, as you know, um, with um, the, the sort of the villain of the piece and where it happens. And it, you know, it's funny, sometimes the world cooperates with you. I mean, this was exactly how the story happened. But the parallels of it, where this helicopter crashed, uh, I'm sorry, I'm referring to things that perhaps the uh, viewers or readers don't know about. But you're making the point, so, so yeah. go ahead. In other words, the book had covered uh, a massacre uh, uh, that had occurred in El Salvador committed by the, the military and mm -hmm. the, the villain in the piece, as you said. So please, go ahead. Yeah, it's Colonel, uh, Colonel Monterosa, right, right. And, uh, who is a fascinating character, was not, I mean, as a villain, Again, he's a fascinating character. I mean, he's, the Americans loved him because he was one of the few officers who would go out in the field. Uh, the, his soldiers loved him because he got down and fought with them. He wasn't thought to be a separate figure who just cared about his money. Um, he uh, was very close to a lot of people, including in the press corps as well, uh, who couldn't believe that he had been the perpetrator of this killing, you know, a thousand, nearly a thousand people. Um, and he had an obsession. He had a number of obs obsessions, but one was the guerrilla radio station, Radio Venceremos, which to him was a symbol of them uh, making fun of the army. And from the beginning of the story, it was him, the, the original operation in which these uh, people were killed, the uh, intent of it was to find this radio. Uh, and the eventual way, and they did find it in that sweep, but the eventual way, um, that he was killed uh, was that uh, his sort of arch enemy on the guerrilla side, Villa Lobos, uh, thought about it. And you know, they were sort of these mirror images who thought about each other all the time. And he said, what, is, what would get Monterosso? What would get him? You know, a trophy, a trophy. He's, he's a hot dog. He would want a trophy. And what is it? Ah, the radio, of course. So they packed the radio with explosives and they left it at a particular point. And they did this operation in which it was absolutely you know, comprehensible that they would have retreated without it. And he took it up in the helicopter, and boom, you know, they blew him up. And almost every character in the story, well, I shouldn't say almost every, but a lot of characters mm -hmm. in the story uh, were at the same place. I mean, it was almost uncanny. Uh, as I started calling people, they all, a lot of them were in another helicopter that went up first. And the guerrillas were on a hill, and they went click and pressed the button, and nothing happened. And they thought, because it was line of sight, you see. So they thought, oh my god, the, the explosives aren't working. The bomb mm -hmm. isn't working. Well, all these other people were in the helicopter. And I actually was in the position to tell some of them that this had happened. Mm -hmm. uh, they were very <laughs> surprised mm -hmm. and not very happy. But when the next helicopter came up, they pointed, it blew up, and it was, happened to be very close to the original. Uh, killing. The, the, the point of these, these uh, striking images, it seems to me, is, is to, to uh, 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 pose the questions in a particular issue uh, in a stark manner. Because I'm, I'm struck in your Bosnia pieces, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the chapters there uh, dealt with uh, the moral blindness uh, of the Clinton administration with regard 
to its own words and its own actions, an incapacity to see the uh, inconsistency between the two. And you link, you link images of the president dancing at a party uh, and learning about that he, in fact, had to intervene in Bosnia one way or the other with the images of the people on the ground in Bosnia who are suffering. So, uh, 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 what, in addition to drawing them in, clearly you use these techniques to make a point. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, tell us a little about that. Well, you know, of course there are, any person who is sitting down at a desk and writing, whether it's writing a short story, a novel, or uh, describing what's happening in Bosnia, is using a lot of the same techniques. Um, there is imagery, there is repetition, there is, you know, certain kinds of description, quotation. Um, now, obviously, one of the differences is, has to do with matters of fact. Um, on the other hand, the organization that's used uh, is arbitrary when, with so-called non-fiction writing, a definition I love because it simply means stuff that isn't fiction. It's not a very uh, well-defined category. Um, but obviously the methods of organization, um, you can call them arbitrary. I mean, they're, the writer has enormous choices to make. Um, and one of the keys is not to be too obvious in making a point. On the other hand, um, I mean, what you're referring to, first of all, happened, you know, um, which is the beginning of, of everything here. In other words, they were dancing, um, and the Clintons, that is, were dancing. This was, a, this was a reception for President Jacques Chirac and his wife in the White House. And it was that evening when he was told by uh, Richard Holbrooke, then the Assistant Secretary of State, um, for European affairs, that indeed if, he, uh, if the Europeans pulled their troops out of Bosnia, their peacekeeping troops, the Americans were already committed to send in their troops to support that extraction. Clinton was under the impression that he could make the decision at the time. In fact, he couldn't. It was already decided. And to me, when I first discovered this, the idea that the President of the United States would not know that it, he was already committed to send 25,000 American troops to Bosnia, something that is an enormous fact in considering what to do about Bosnia, that he would not know it was extraordinary. I just found it, you know, incomprehensible. And, uh, or, or, to put it another way, terribly comprehensible when you look at the policy of the Clinton administration. So the question was, here we had a series of facts. They happened. How to describe it in a way that presents not only the series of facts, but the moral uh, conflict and the moral um, uh, how, irresponsibility, if you want to put it that way, uh, to me that was part of this uh, lack of knowledge. Um, and the dancing, the blithe dancing together with finding this out at the same time. I mean, I said a moment ago that the world sometimes cooperates with you. And it's not only sometimes, it's a lot of the time it cooperates with you. I mean, you know, you couldn't do that in a novel because it would be too obvious. It would be t too obvious a uh, juxtaposition, mm -hmm. you know, and the cr a critic would say, you know, there's no subtlety there. Mm -hmm. But this is real life. And because the reader has a right to demand and to expect that this is fact, the reader can be struck by it and it can be effective because I have fact behind me, supposedly. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what they should expect. If you did it in fiction, you know, uh, since I would have nothing like that behind me, I would be a rather, making a rather unsubtle point. In all of your writings, uh, a theme that emerges again and again uh, is the use of words by actors, by politicians, uh, by uh, statesmen responding to events and so on. How, how do you uh, compare uh, your use of words as a writer uh, with the use of words that uh, you're, one in, is constantly uh, encountering in uh, your uh, uh, writings. Uh, I have a quote here. 
uh, uh, with regard to El Salvador. Assistant Secretary of State Niles said we don't have, I'm sorry, this was with regard to Bosnia. Assistant Secretary of State Niles said we don't have thus far substantiated information that would confirm the existence of the camp. Uh, yes. This was about whether there were uh, concentration camps in, in Bosnia. Uh, you also discuss how the fear of uh, Clinton administration officials to use the word genocide, least it create a situation where they would have to act. On and on, uh, the Reagan administration's response uh, to the events uh, in El Salvador. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a very good question. And it's, again, a very big one, I think. Um, Niles, uh, of course, this was part of, of a longer theme, as you mentioned, uh, that had to do with shying away from saying things that might implicate uh, first the Bush administration and later the Clinton administration in taking actions that it had to take uh, according to international agreements. If they started to identify what was happening in Bosnia as genocide, uh, the Genocide Treaty presumably would come into effect. That's never happened, so it's unclear. Uh, what would happen, but presumably they would have responsibility to act in some way. Um, so they shied away from using this. So the ironic effect of the Genocide Treaty was uh, there was lying at the highest level or misrepresentation at the highest level of government about what was going on. Niles, Niles's statement uh, was this remarkable effort after the camps had been made public to then come up and deny the government knew about them. I actually found and published in a later uh, uh, piece in that same series in the New York Review of Books, a document from the Pentagon that I think they declassified probably by mistake um, in a FOIA request that had three columns. Uh, the first column was name of camp. Second column <laughs> was number of people, mm. number of prisoners. The third was number liquidated. This was from the Pentagon. It went on for three pages, and that tiny type uh, that is used for cables, it was a cable. Uh, so you had these vast numbers of people killed, and this was, the date was blacked out, but it certainly was in July at the latest of 92, so at least a month before that, but probably uh, quite a bit earlier. Uh, to get back to your original question, the use of words, um, obviously the government uses words for all sorts of reasons and never innocently. That is to say, every word they use officially means something. It's a matter of record. They've put themselves on record as uh, uh, taking responsibility for something, as commenting on something. Uh, every use of their, uh, every time they speak, it's political in some way. Um, I do something different, which is, again, I try to tell a story, try to tell what happened. Um, which is a very different thing, and uh, it's, I have a great deal more freedom in a way. Um, it can be a difficult task, and anybody who's tried to do this sort of thing knows it, but uh, it's a lot easier in a funny way because the implications uh, following from each of these words are not the same on the level of government. I'm simply trying to find out what happened and tell the story. Um, uh, and however modest that sounds, you know, that is, in the end, the fact. You're trying to tell it, you're trying to tell it in a way uh, that people uh, will be able to read it and would be fascinated by it, and you're trying to do it in a way um, with certain complications and images that you've talked about. Um, the government, I mean, I spend a lot of time in my pieces, I think, as you're implying partly uh, by your question, analyzing how people in government speak. Um, and you have to, and perhaps it's uh, helpful uh, that I spent a lot of time reading novels and also learning how to analyze uh, writing in novels. Um, to, it helps me actually look at how people talk and try to understand it on a deeper level. Um, I did that in the piece on El Masote, the book on El Masote, uh, where the, one of the main actors is called uh, Todd Greentree. A name, again, you couldn't have made up. If you, used it in a, <laughs> if you used it in a novel, it would have been far too obvious. And he was he, an American diplomat. He was yeah. an American diplomat, a very a green tree, you know, the youngest member of the embassy, innocent, who came down and immediately was confronted with this moral uh, conundrum because these people had been killed. He was placed in the situation of A, investigating it, B, concluding, as he told me eventually, I interviewed him in Nepal, where he was then stationed, 
uh, that um, it did in fact hap happen, excuse me, the massacre, and writing a cable that essentially denied it happened. But if you look closely at the cable, if you analyze it closely, you can find all sorts of odd things that are in it. They're almost like dream imagery in a funny way. Mm -hmm. I mean, perhaps a very experienced diplomat, in fact, I'm sure a very experienced diplomat, would not have put the things he did in this cable. Because though he had an executive summary that essentially denied this event. And it was important place. for the Reagan administration that this event Very. not have occurred in order to get the funding for exactly. programs for that country. Again, it's the world cooperating. I mean, this massacre was made public the day before the so-called certification went to Congress. The Reagan ad administration was then required to certify that the Salvadoran government was improving in its uh, respect for human rights to get foreign aid, which was crucial to the war. Um, anyway, Green Tree wrote this cable that, you know, if you analyze it at length, as I tried to do, along with an interview with him, you can discover in the cable, mm -hmm. that is a contemporary document, that he had enormous doubts about what happened. He didn't say it explicitly, but they're all over it, you know. You don't have to read them into it. There are all sorts of strange quotes and things that he shouldn't have included, certainly. Um, but I took that to mean that he was rather guilty about what he had said and what he had concluded. Uh, he was playing the good uh, soldier, but he couldn't quite do it. He couldn't quite pull it off. And, um, uh, and to, with respect to that story, he's still like that in a way, even though he's a much more experienced diplomat today. The, it, it's striking that your, your compelling imagery and your compelling analysis, in a way, uh, rest on uh, a very great simplicity, uh, which is uh, uh, hearing, listening well, and recording, and putting things together. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, I take that as a great compliment. I mean, the, I was in a class the other day uh, and we were talking about interviewing, and they said, how do you get, uh, for example, there's a, again a woman who's absolutely crucial to the El Masote story named Rufina Amaya, who uh, was the one surviving adult witness of what happened during the massacre. And we should clarify again that, that this was an incident where the military slayed uh, 700 plus yes. women, children, and, and, and adults. Men. Yeah, mm -hmm. and men. That's right, uh, during one day. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, she had witnessed it, and yet she had told the story various times. So how do you interview her and absolutely bring her back from actually telling the story, that is repeating it, to being there? In other words, to getting her to, to be at the event, speaking from there, not from a retelling. I mean, you have a similar problem with people who are on book tours, you know, they, they, the, the mouth just goes, they're not thinking anymore uh, about the actual questions. And um, the only way to do it is to establish, you have to establish with anyone you interview, obviously, a relationship, a human relationship where they have trust in you and uh, they feel like you're sympathetic to them and they want to talk and uh, they feel like you're listening. And this can take a long time, but it's the uh, crucial part very much of, of doing one of these stories. Um, you have to have them speak and trust you, and it can be very difficult. I'm mean, Janet Malcolm, uh, my colleague at The New Yorker, has written uh, in, uh, 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 I believe it's the, the Journalist and the Murderer, I think the book is called, very controversial, about how each writer is a seducer in a way. And I think that there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, you're presenting yourself in a way uh, that will um, get people to trust you. And that's just a fact. It's a fact of life if you're going to be doing this uh, trade um, or this business or whatever you'd like to, to call it. Uh, you have to learn how to talk to people, any kind of people. Your, your work has uh, uh, won a number of awards uh, uh, and so on. And I, I'm just curious, how do you see uh, your product uh, uh, contributing to the moral uh, education of your readers on the one hand and to the policy debate on the other? Why? Well, that's a difficult um, question. Uh, 
I don't, um, I try to do, to tell the story, to get it right and to tell it well. Um, I don't really think about the moral education of readers. Um, insofar as I think of the readers, I think of them as people who might get bored. <laughs> and, uh, I'm sorry, but that is the case. I mean, I think that they have a right to expect a story as told tautly, and, and even though what I write tends to be quite long. Uh, um, so the moral issues, I think, just come out of the particular stories. I mean, Bosnia is, for many Americans, certainly for American officials, a deeply moral problem. You know, what, is there something that we owe to this place? Why? Cold War is over. Why is there any responsibility there? Um, is it because of national security? Is it because of idealistic reasons that have to do with uh, uh, the number of people being killed and the horror of the place? Uh, should that matter? Um, uh, should we be in a position to bemoan it, uh, denounce it, but not necessarily uh, intervene to stop it? Um, and finally, how do officials who in the end are employed by us, who are our leaders um, and our servants as this government is supposed to work, how do they behave? And how is their behavior influenced by us? Uh, in that way, we're implicated. Um, and that way we're implicated all the time, I think. Uh, we have a, a weight in the world as Americans that's very, very great. And this is one thing that I uh, uh, find a great, uh, I find is a pity, um, that Americans don't tend to be aware of that. Um, that we will look at a place, it's like a searchlight, um, Nicaragua, Salvador, uh, Grenada, you name it, Haiti. The searchlight will focus for a few moments in time, enough time perhaps to leave some, uh, to intervene, to make an enormous difference in a country. And the searchlight, uh, you know, the focus for those people sitting in the United States who suddenly learn a little bit about it, the searchlight will move on and this place will be in darkness again with a few more ruins and a few more problems. Um, and that I think is a very great pity. Um, insofar as, you know, you can tell the story so uh, it's as full as possible, um, so it's captivating and also moving, but you get it right, uh, which is a very pompous thing to say, but nonetheless, I think that's what your ambition has to be. Uh, I think that's where you're successful. Um, but I don't have any pretensions to altering the moral views of people, you know, uh, that's up to, that's in the end up to them, I guess. What, one final question, what uh, would you tell uh, young people who want to become a writer and maybe a writer about foreign affairs or other kind of, what, what, what are the attributes uh, of somebody with this calling, pursuing it in the way you're pursuing it? Um, well, if they have the calling, they don't need to be encouraged necessarily. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, they feel it and want to do it. I would tell them to read. You write with your ears. Uh, you write with your ears. That is, you uh, must read and read and read and read the best sort of writing that you can uh, so that you have in your head the dance of words. Um, and you should spend a lot of time doing that. And if you're majoring in mass communications or something like that, even though I hope all mass communications majors will forgive me because I just use that as an example, mm -hmm. I would switch to history or English or philosophy. Uh, I would get a liberal arts education uh, in which you learn how to uh, read well, you learn how to understand the world insofar as you can, you learn about the humanistic history of uh, Western culture um, and uh, I would just, I would do an awful lot of reading and I would read the paper um, uh, and I would start writing in a journal. I would try to uh, each day put words on the page because the greatest problem of course is each day sitting down and putting words on the page, at least it is for me. Um, you know, there are others uh, for whom that's not a problem and I envy them. 
Uh, I really envy them. <laughs> <laughs> I, wish they'd, I wish I could say they were all terrible, but you, know, you do have people who are these amazing writers who are incredibly productive. I don't know how they do it, but uh, uh, I envy them enormously. Um, but I would write and I would read. Those are the two biggest things I would recommend people do. Mark, uh, thank you very much for taking time uh, from your busy schedule to be here with us today. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. My pleasure. I enjoyed it.